It was a diplomatic coup for India when Prime Minister Narendra Modi arrived on the very first day and said that a G20 consensus had been achieved. But ever since that diplomatic coup, there's been a diplomatic standoff also between India and Canada. To talk about that, to talk about the changing dynamics of India's foreign policy, we have with us BJP's National Vice President, Bichayan Chepanta. Thank you very much for joining us. So I want to begin by asking you uh, about India, Canada, before we dive into the G20, the much important topic. You saw Justin Trudeau's remarks at the House of Commons, and we've seen India's response. We've seen Jay Shankar actually speaking uh, out in the United States at multiple forums. What was your first reaction to it? To begin with, I think uh, I should reiterate that India's MEA has given a very strong rebuttal to that statement of Prime Minister Trudeau. Uh, it's bizarre, actually, that the Prime Minister of a country who says the Indo-Pacific is his top priority in geopolitics and the relationship with India is very important, just like it is to almost every other country, to make such a statement on the basis of allegations. Uh, it, it just defies uh, common sense. Uh, now, you'll see that over the past 10 days, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau seems to have tempered down his statements quite a lot. And he has essentially isolated Canada in the rest of the world because uh, other than a few pro forma comments, uh, there has been no support for him, even from within the G7 of which Canada is a member. See, the hypocrisy of it is really what is truly galling. Now, Canada has unfortunately got a track record of sheltering terrorists. These are not just Khalistani terrorists who have killed many Indians starting four decades ago with the Kanishka bombing, they've killed Canadians. But Canada also has a track record of uh, sheltering terrorists and extremists of all kinds. Uh, they seem to turn a blind eye to ISI uh, actually assassinating people like the Balochistani activist Karima Baloch. They seem to turn a blind eye to, can to China interfering in Canada. And whereas India, a democracy and open society has very clearly conveyed many times that we have these terrorist elements who have been involved in planning and executing terror operations in India that have killed a lot of people. They've not taken any action. More than a dozen extradition requirement, uh, requests have been pending. And then to give us these hypocritical lectures, now uh, that time is gone. India is not the old India which will just uh, roll over and play dead. This is a new India. This is an India which is the fifth largest economy of the world. It's, on, it's the fastest growing, on the way to becoming the third largest economy. We want friendly relations with every country, including Canada. Now, virtually every nation in the world, even those two or three nations that seem to have a problem with India's rise, even those nations want uh, trade relationships with India, good ties with India. You've seen that. And uh, this just defies all the odds. I think I'll conclude this by saying that uh, from what one hears, um, Mr. Trudeau is running behind in the polls in, uh, uh, in Canada. And perhaps this is a desperate attempt to try and uh, uh, stir the waters somehow, uh, try to retain his Khalistani supporters somehow who seem to be also moving away from him. Uh, he has been questioned by Canada's own leader of the opposition. He has been questioned by many other politicians. He's not been able to come up with any kind of evidence whatsoever. So it just defies all common sense. External Affairs Minister Jay Shankar was speaking uh, on multiple forums in the United States recently. And he gave a very calculate, re calculated response to the Khalistani questions, but yet firm. He didn't want to escalate the situation. But yes, he wanted to comment on the organized crime the Khalistani networks, the ganglands and the violence uh, that is getting a safe sanctuary in Canada. How do you react now for more than a year? We've seen posters being printed, particularly in Canada, UK, US and Australia, but more brazenly in Canada, of Indian diplomats, uh, both the ambassador, the high commissioners and of course the council generals saying kill India, almost putting a bounty on their head, provoking violence, inciting violence, and the Canadians saying this is freedom of expression. Isn't it a bizarre? 
Dr. Jayashankar has done a superb job of communicating India's stand. Uh, like you said, being the external affairs minister, he has to maintain certain decorum. Now, I'm not in government. I can be more blunt. The reality is, uh, you're right, Canada had all these big hoardings up there where these Khalistani terrorists were openly advocating the murder of Indian diplomats. There are so many videos uh, on the internet where you can see that Indian diaspora people in Canada are being threatened by these Khalistanis. You're seeing these Khalistani terrorists disrupting activities such as at Gurdwaras in the UK as well and uh, in Canada, of course. Now, no civilized country allows this kind of element to operate freely within their, on their soil. Uh, to, uh, to give us lectures about freedom of speech. Now, remember, uh, Canada itself has many secessionist movements. The most uh, prominent of them is the Quebec Freedom Movement. In the past, Canada had allowed referendums, but today they don't allow referendums on the Quebec Freedom Movement. Earlier this year, Politico reported that uh, increasing numbers of Quebecois are now wanting independence, but they are not allowing a referendum. So maybe we should reciprocate this gesture of freedom of speech. And there are many capable parties in India uh, who can facilitate an online referendum so that uh, people from Quebec can uh, uh, actively explain why they want to be independent. Um, uh, also, uh, there are elected representatives in Canada, such as uh, Paul Plamondon, the Parti Quebecois representative, who has been going around the world, especially meeting European leaders, explaining their cause, why they want to be independent of Canada. Uh, you know, reciprocating Canada's uh, uh, gestures. I think uh, we should reciprocate this. I will be happy to host somebody like Paul Plamondon to come to India and explain and uh, take his message to the public about why Quebec should be independent. Canada has a terrible track record of atrocities against the indigenous community of Canada. Uh, the French speaking people of Quebec want to be separate. Uh, you know, the, as I said, civilized countries don't allow terrorists. You've seen the uh, videos of this man, uh, Nijar, going around shooting AK-47s. Now, there, there is plenty of evidence that these uh, Khalistani terrorists have been getting training in Pakistan by ISI and they go via Canada. No civilized country, especially a member of G7, should be allowing this, much less giving us lectures. Now, look, till now, the only country that was so brazen in our experience was Pakistan, who has been, uh, Pakistan have been supporting terrorists on their soil. They've been uh, uh, sending terrorists across the LOC to attack India in cross-border terrorism, state-sponsored. Now, because of that obsession, Pakistan has reduced itself to uh, penury, and it's going around surviving on begging various nations. Now, if Canada wants to emulate Pakistan, uh, they will end up in that same fate, that same famous line that if you nurture snakes in your background, backyard, they will bite you. And that will be true of Canada as well, just as it has been true of Pakistan. Uh, and there will be no uh, uh, five eyes or G7 to bail them out. But of course, it is uh, up to the people of Canada to decide who they want to lead them and how they want to function as a country. Uh, but clearly they seem to be at sixes and sevens as to who they are as a country. Are you also suggesting, since you mentioned the Quebec, uh, that the so-called referendums that have been happening in Canada, more so in Brampton, Vancouver and other places, and Khalistani ideology, so-called ideology, doesn't find any resonance in Indian Punjab. So perhaps Canada is inching towards a Khalistan of itself, a Republic of Khalistan within Canada. And a second part question, that is the new international rules-based order that the West provenates. Is it really a rules-based order of convenience that changes with their thought process and they do not see what the Global South or the others think about it? So, you're quite right. Allowing these uh, shambolic referendums in Brampton and other parts of Canada about Khalistan is bizarre, particularly when in recent years, Canada is not permitting referendums on Quebec who want to separate. And to have a referendum relating to a, another country on their soil uh, is nothing short of direct interference in our 
integrity as a nation and uh, in our national security. So, you know, the, if they get a taste of their own medicine, then they shouldn't go complaining uh, for, for whatever reason. Now, regarding the so-called rules-based, the reality is that this is a period of great transition. There was a time for many decades after World War II where there was a certain kind of a rules-based order. There was uh, the Cold War paradigm. There were a bipolar world between the US and the USSR. And after the 90s, it became a unipolar world for a long time. Today, it is no longer a unipolar world. Countries like China are breaking those rules. Countries like China are showing naked aggression towards India, towards Taiwan, towards uh, Japan, towards Philippines, Indonesia. They are violating the very norms uh, of the whatever world order existed of which they took advantage, for example, WTO, etc. Uh, but it is not a bipolar world again, not uh, US and China. It is a multipolar world. Japan is a, is a major power. India is a, is a rising power. Uh, so it cannot, the, any rules of the world can no longer be dictated uh, from the West. It can't be European, it can't be American. It has to be by a confluence of the large countries, especially the democratic countries, such as the Quad, which are all four are democratic nations. Now, remember that this transformation is actually symbolized by India and symbolized by the leadership of Prime Minister Modi. Because take a look at the last few years. Uh, during the pandemic, the whole world predicted that India would collapse. In fact, India performed the best in terms of managing mortality, in terms of managing the economy, and ran the biggest vaccination campaign in human history in the shortest time. India also helped uh, you know, well over 100 countries with vaccines and many scores of other countries with many other facilities, medicine, and subsequently more than a dozen countries have been helped by India financially. So this is a different India, and you can see that world leaders increasingly are looking to India, are looking to Prime Minister Modi to help find solutions. So it can't be that any kind of world order today uh, can happen uh, without India's involvement. Uh, we are the largest democracy that humankind has ever seen. Uh, we are at the forefront of tackling the biggest challenges that uh, the world is seeing in the current era. So that kind of uh, attitude is, uh, if anybody thinks that they can have a new world order based on uh, European and uh, Western paradigms, then that is a colonial mindset and they are well past their uh, sell-by date. One last Canada question, uh, technically a UK question, because recently we had an attempt to attack, manhandle, uh, and almost act violently against the Indian High Commissioner in UK, V. Dorai Swami. He was visiting Glasgow Gurdwara at the invitation of the Sikh community. And while he was visiting there, uh, there was an attempt to, you know, open the gates of his car and forcibly manhandle him. Uh, to which, of course, he had to leave immediately and there was a police complaint that was registered. How concerned are you uh, for the security of top Indian diplomats in these major countries, including UK, Canada and US? In Canada, of course, the diplomats have to move around with security. But uh, in UK and US, what do you expect the government, the administrations and the local enforcement to do? You know, there is a history. Indian diplomats have been attacked in places like Pakistan, in the UK, in Canada, and in fact have also been assassinated. So this is not something we can take lightly at all. In the UK, we've had some experience over the past couple of years uh, where large numbers of um, uh, the expatriate Pakistani community or the Khalistani uh, extremists have come and uh, uh, ars done arson and violence with the Indian uh, High Commission and consulates. Um, because there was a feeling that uh, there was not enough security to Indian diplomats in the UK, uh, steps were taken last year where we said we will have a quid pro quo approach that uh, uh, in, in any country where Indian diplomats' safety and security levels are lowered, we will give them a similarly appropriate level of secu security here and uh, not necessarily maintain uh, a holier-than-thou attitude and just support them no matter what. Uh, uh, when that happened, the, the UK quickly changed its orientation last year 
uh, because there had been August 15th on our Independence Day, similar violence at the Indian High Commission and after that action was taken. If again it is recurring, then of course it is up to the UK government to examine why law and order is breaking down. Why is it breaking down particularly for the Indian diplomats and the Indian community, despite the fact that the Gurdwara itself has issued a very strong condemnation that they don't support these Khalistani elements, they don't know these people who uh, are Khalistani extremists who have come and disrupted and, and threatened violence to the Indian High Commissioner. So they have to take action, otherwise we will behave uh, appropriately and, and accordingly. Uh, as I said, this is not an India that will be pushed around. We are going to act in a principled manner, but uh, anybody that has a mindset that uh, this is a post-colonial India intimidated by the West, it is a developing country going around with a begging bowl and therefore will take any kind of hypocritical lecturing from a Western nation despite their own uh, atrocious uh, lack of commitment to geopolitical norms, we won't do it. And we have had, in fact, as you quoted in the 80s, an Indian diplomat, Ravindra Matre, who was killed brutally. And I'm told that it's been almost 40 years and the killer is still at large. The UK hasn't been able to arrest him. We are seeing similar uh, uh, information of concern. <clears throat> the, the Air India Kanishka bombing investigation in Canada was suppressed for a very long time. Now we heard recently that this guy Nijjar who uh, died seems to have been in regular contact with Canadian intelligence. And you're right about uh, the Indian diplomat who was assassinated in the UK. Uh, the, the, you know, the killers having gone scot-free. So if there is an intelligence connection in those home countries of this tiny expatriate group which is causing violence in India, and those countries are somehow tolerating it or not very aggressively pursuing uh, safety and security for not just Indian diplomats, but for the Indian diaspora who don't tolerate this kind of nonsense, or if they are not actively pursuing justice for crimes committed by such extremists, uh, that's not a sustainable situation. That, that's not how you maintain friendship. That's not how you want to have a good relationship with the most populous nation in the world, soon to be the third largest economy in the world. Uh, you know, we will, we believe in Vasudeva Kutumbakam. We believe in having friendly relations with all nations. But uh, I think the era of us accepting being pushed around is over. Moving on now uh, to something positive, something historic. That was the recently concluded G20. And while I was reporting on that throughout the year, you know, there was this huge background noise of Russia-Ukraine conflict. And international media reportage and even the foreign policy wonks saying that a consensus can never be achieved in New Delhi. Perhaps it would be worse than what happened in Bali. The unthinkable happened. Prime Minister Modi, you know, came on the very first day on the screens out there and said that the consensus had been achieved, not just on the paras that involved Russia and Ukraine, but a 37 page document with multiple headlines from climate change to terrorism uh, to several other aspects of the G20. How significant was it? How was the unthinkable really achieved? I'll address this in a minute, but think about this. This was not just another G20. It was not just that by rotation it came to India. That's of course the process. Think about the scale. Uh, a typical G20 presidency involves uh, a handful of events. A very large one, uh, something like a, uh, Canada, uh, I'm sorry, a, a China uh, had it in about a dozen places. India's G20 presidency under Prime Minister Modi had 200 events spread over 60 cities and other locations. So on, by scale, it was far more than an order of magnitude higher than the biggest G20 that had ever been held. And you can see that branding effect all over the country, people taking pride. Uh, and it was a way of showcasing India to the world because of the large number of delegates who visited here and also taking Indians closer to the rest of the world by interacting with all of them. Now this second point is particularly critical because this G20 presidency happened uh, during this war in Europe and you are right 
Because of that, there was a great deal of pessimism. It was repeatedly said that there was no question of a joint communique. And yet, Prime Minister Modi uh, ably uh, aided by his team, including the Sherpa and others, pulled a rabbit out of the hat. I give credit to the Prime Minister's immense popularity and clout. You know, just a couple of weeks ago, Pew Global uh, did a survey and said Prime Minister Modi has an 80% approval rating. Just think about that for a moment. That is just astronomical because in most democracies, if the leader has a 45% approval rating, it is considered very good. The most they ever aspire for is something like a 50% approval rating. And for somebody to have an 80% approval rating, it is stratospheric. So that and the way he has leveraged India's growing clout, the way he has leveraged India's diaspora, which is the largest in the world, you can see, you know, the rock star treatment that Prime Minister Modi gets, whether he goes to Wembley Stadium or Madison Square Garden or recently in Australia or the Middle East or Africa, uh, it has a purpose, it has a benefit to India. That rock star treatment that he gets has been leveraged in helping persuade his peers, the leaders of other nations, that India counts and it is important. Uh, and it's not just a communique. The IMEC, which was announced, the new economic corridor through the Middle East and Europe is a phenomenal uh, uh, new development. It, it reshapes the geopolitical calculations of, uh, that impact global trade and global order. Uh, you know, it, it's been a completely uh, huge success and uh, sort of crowning glory in the second term of Prime Minister Modi setting the stage ideally for the third term. What does the success of G20 uh, really mean for the changing foreign policy of India and also India's standing globally? In the last G20, Prime Minister Modi said that this is not an era of war. And that was mentioned at the communique of G20 this time around. India plays a significant role uh, in the court on Indo-Pacific. Uh, India, of course, has a strategic bilateral cooperation with the US and, of course, with the recent meeting with Biden, it was elaborated in the 29-point joint statement. India also is significantly, you know, concerned about its relations with China, while on the other side, it has completely ignored and isolated Pakistan, just like it's doing with Canada. How is significant is India's foreign policy today? What does this mean for New Delhi? India's foreign policy has come such a long way that if you think about it, during this period of war in Europe, the Modi government has had to walk a tightrope because on the one hand, we are dependent on imported petroleum, which has been disrupted because of the war. We can't afford to let the 1.4 billion people of India down by taking a stand as we used to in past decades with high sounding uh, theories which were for the benefit of other nations, but not for us. We have also stopped being lectured by European nations who themselves were buying Russian oil, but were lecturing India at the same time not to do so. This happened last year. Our foreign minister pointed out this hypocrisy. So in that context, for India to have such a balanced and nuanced stand, that on the one hand, we, we very clearly, Prime Minister Modi has enunciated that it is not a time of war we would like and we will help facilitate in any way possible that the war should end. At the same time, we will not be lectured to hypocritically by countries who say one thing to us and do another thing themselves. And there has been no sanctions, there has been no uh, uh, breakdown of relations with other countries as used to be the case in earlier years. This demonstrates the clout that today's India carries and the clout that Prime Minister Narendra Modi carries. It also demonstrates the skill and the dexterity with which the Modi government uh, has managed this crisis. So uh, this is very, very transformational in terms of uh, India's clout. And I think the world recognizes that. Does that really mean that it is time for UNSC reforms? Uh, we've been talking about it for decades together. Is it even possible? with several countries, including the US, and we've had on the sidelines of the UNGA, several countries coming out 
and saying they support India's permanent membership of the UNSC. Do you think it is uh, inevitable it is to happen or do you think there is a technical hold to it and it's likely not to happen? The fact is that it is long overdue. But for a miscalculation by our first Prime Minister, India would have been in the United States, uh, in the uh, United Nations uh, Security Council. But for whatever reason, it was turned down. And uh, we have never stopped regretting that moment because it was given to China. And you see how China has misused it by using its veto indiscriminately against India, against uh, notifying terrorists, terrorist organizations, and so on and so forth. Look, it defies common sense that the most populous nation on earth, which happens to be a democracy, the biggest democracy humankind has ever seen, is not part of the uh, highest uh, United Nations decision-making body. The reality is, if the UN doesn't reform itself, its credibility is already very damaged. This is something again that our foreign minister has pointed out. If the UN wants to keep India out from permanent membership of the UNSC, it can't be taken seriously for very much longer. Unless it, you know, for, it's better for the UN to reform, it is better for the whole world to reform. Uh, India will of course play a positive role. But if the UN does not reform, it is being bypassed by many other forums. Much of the work that the UN could have been doing is today being done by other multilateral forums where India is getting its due weightage. So that's something for the world to ponder. Again, most nations in the world support India being in the Security Council, whether you consult African nations, most European nations, certainly democracies, uh, it's really high time. One significant issue that was also discussed at the G20 was women empowerment. And under-representation of women, particularly in political representation. Uh, but immediately we had a grouping that was a consensus that was achieved at the G20, but India walking the talk and actually passing the Women's Reservation Bill. How historic is that? Because it's not just an India concern, it's a global phenomenon. And do you think many countries around the world will take inspiration and a cue from India now? I think Prime Minister Modi has uh set a track record of achieving targets which had long been thought to be desirable but unachievable, uh, like getting rid of the only article in the constitution which was termed a temporary article, which was Article 370, giving freedom to all uh, Indian citizens in Jammu and Kashmir on the same level playing field as, uh, as anybody else. Uh, you have seen Things like the goods and services tax for 20 years overdue got done by the Modi government, uniting India as one market for the first time, even though it had been independent already for seven decades. Uh, you have seen the commitment to climate change, where although India still has a principled position about the equity of it, because on a per capita basis, uh, the nations which created the problem are still emitting much more and they need to do a lot more, which they have committed at various uh, world gatherings, but are not living up to. But the Modi government didn't let that come in the way of India making a massive thrust towards renewables. We are far ahead of our targets that we had committed to uh, for uh, net zero targets. We are ahead of the curve. So it, it is no surprise that within weeks or literally days after G20, when there was a commitment to bring about equality for women, then the uh, Women's Reservation Bill has been passed in Parliament. So this is a government that does what it says, that commits uh, very, very significant objectives and aims in, uh, in our party manifesto, uh, and, and then the government implements it. So it is, of course, a stunning development to have one third of parliament represented by women is going to make a huge difference in the coming years for the country, for gender equity, but overall for the well-being and development of the nation. Mr. Panda, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.